If any of these words describe you or your feelings, you depression. may suffer from depression. depression. Where do we even start? Are you human? If so, you may have depression. Are you a dog? You may have depression. Depression, antidepressants, addiction, trauma, group therapy. Of course, it's another episode of BoJack. This time we're going to watch episode seven of season six called The Face of Depression. Ready? Let's crack on. So this is him just home from rehab, right? Back to the state of his own gaff. Can he stand to be in the place which was where most of his drinking occurred? I'm not kidding. The pills. Now! I told you, I'm on a system now. I'm not doing drugs. I'm not like this you. Way. I don't fetishize my own No, sadness. my hands are so slippery. Damn it, Todd. Clean up your shit. You know I had sex with Emily. Hmm. Our minds are, are, are like sponges. We constantly learn from our experiences, both good and bad, including what we see around us. And with time, we often associate things together. This is the basis of classical conditioning. Some of you might be familiar with the Pavlov's dogs experiment, where you ring a bell, you make some food, and before long, dogs start salivating just at the sound of the bell because you're associating that sound with the presence of food. It's an environmental cue that your mind uses to predict an outcome and usually is associated with both a psychological and physiological response. With addiction, we get similar environmental cues, particularly as by the time that dependence has developed, usually using that drug, using alcohol, engaging in that behavior, for example, if it's a behavioral addiction like gambling, becomes quite routine driven and ritualistic. A location can be a cue, seeing an advert for alcohol can be a cue, seeing an empty bottle of alcohol can be a cue. And this is why it's our environment that can often contain the cues that can then trigger relapse. Therapy's hard. God damn it. And there's lots of forms of these sort of group psychological support or group therapies, uh, whether it's more spiritual ones like 12 Steps or whether it's the non-spiritual alternatives. The key to success, though, is to have a stable, sober support network that you can build trust in. Surround yourself with cues about the positives of sobriety, not cues that lead to temptation to drink again. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Bojack and, uh, oh God, this feels so dumb. And I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bojack. At the core of addiction and the psychological techniques that are used to treat addiction, like motivational interviewing, is a concept called cognitive dissonance, where our thought patterns and our behaviors are almost contradicting each other. I know this drug or alcohol is really bad for me and it's making me do bad things that are hurting me. Yes, I keep doing it. And in the midst of addiction, we find ourselves much more likely to change the thought patterns to match the behavior than the other way around. I can quit any time I want. I'm only a social drinker. I don't drink as much as they do, so can I, can, I can keep going, right? There's no problem. Motivational interviewing is the psychological technique that tries to guide somebody to coming to this light bulb moment where they realize there is this cognitive dissonance and that actually it's the behavior that needs to change, not the cognitions. Admitting that the drink is a problem is a step to towards that and kind of tries to counteract the denial that can go as part of changing the cognitions rather than the behaviors. What I'm dealing with? Your psychiatrist said you're depressed. Okay, yeah, I've been a little depressed, but I'm not like depressed. I don't have depression. You're smoking three packs a day. You've been wearing the same pajama bottoms for weeks. This is all part of my writing process. My best stuff comes out when I hate myself. <laughs> what stuff? No stuff is coming out. <sighs> There's some cognitive distortions going on there, kind of almost implying that being depressed is good for creativity. Sadness and depression are not the same thing. So sadness is temporary. It's almost always got a clear trigger. It's a normal, albeit unpleasant human emotion that uh, we kind of need to learn to just sit with and deal with. It's an important one to feel. Sadness has a value in life. Depression is often described to me by my patients as more of a feeling of emptiness and nothingness. It's incredibly persistent and can become all encompassing that not just affects your energy levels and your thought patterns, but then affects sleep and appetite, libido, just pretty much everything. And that's why it has this knock-on effect on your relationships, work, and, and pretty much all aspects of your life. Depression is an illness. It doesn't always have a clear trigger, and it certainly doesn't usually have a singular cause. It's nobody's fault to have depression, and it is an illness that is in need of treatment. I'd feel better if you just tried the medication your doctor prescribed. Well, I'd feel worse. They put me on Prozac in college, and I was so calm and boring, I didn't even want a live journal. And then 
then Dawson's Creek got bad because there was no one to speak truth to power. Dawson's Creek did not get bad. You just started taking antidepressants, which you should also do now. I think Dawson's Creek is a bit before my time. Um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are the most common group of antidepressant medications that we prescribe. Yes, they do cause this initial biochemical change where they increase the availability of serotonin within key circuits in our brain implicated in depression, but it is likely the downstream effects of this on inflammation within the brain and the way that neurons connect with one another that then mediates the antidepressant response and accounts for why there's a bit of a delay between this initial biochemical change and the antidepressant effects actually kicking in, usually by at least seven to 10 days, if not a couple of weeks. Prozac is the brand name for the SSRI fluoxetine. This is the first SSRI that we actually developed and it's still widely used today. It sucks. It made me break out. I gained weight. What if you leave and come back to this person you don't even recognize? I don't even recognize you now. Weight gain can be a direct side effect of some antidepressants, particularly those that have antihistamine effects, metazapine and tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, though we don't use those anywhere near as often anymore. It's less of a side effect with SSRIs, though I can't sit here and say it's absolutely not associated with those whatsoever. But the other thing to bear in mind is that weight gain might be a sign that your body is starting to respond to treatment. Often depression is associated with a reduction in your appetite. As you start taking treatment, that appetite comes back up. And sometimes that might be something you notice before you notice the cognitive changes where that hopelessness um, and that lack of motivation starts to alleviate itself. So you get people that have a, a bit of a better appetite, but maybe don't have the motivation to go out and start doing stuff and building structure to your day. So fluctuations in weight as people experience depression and get treatment for depression is common, but there's actually quite a wide differential as to why it may occur. You're making this a bigger thing than it is. I'll be fine. Minimizing. Don't fall for one of those models. Rationalizing. I'm a one woman man. Normalizing. If that woman happens to be a turtle in a two piece, that's just destiny. <laughs> All of these are cognitive distortions, and all of it goes back to that principle of cognitive dissonance. I know carrying on like I am is bad for me, yet I'm not doing anything to try and change it, even though somebody is actually offering support, professional support, and you've got personal support then with a partner. In this case, she's changing those thought patterns to rationalize the behavior rather than the other way around. Um, and it also kind of goes some way to explain why behavioral forms of cognitive behavioral therapy can be really effective. I'm a big proponent of behavioral action activation, using powers of persuasion to try and get people out for a walk, for example, even if you don't really feel like it, just because doing something can actually help your brain to realize that there are more options than just sort of sitting there with your own thoughts. There is something to it. To us and depression. <laughs> yes. But before I drink to that and then depart with you on a cross country tour of speaking engagements as the quote unquote face of depression, there is something I feel I must get off my chest. As it says on the cover of my last I'm single, you can tell me anything. You can tell me anything. I am not depressed. <gasps> Wait, how can you know that? Well, I feel very happy. Oh, I know. <sighs> Just as I suspect. Half full. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> That question of how do you know, I mean, not everybody's depression is the same. So it's usually a case of comparing yourself now to comparing what things were like six months ago, a year ago. What's the difference in how you're relating to yourself, to other people, to the world around you, and just your broader day-to-day -day function? The difficulty though, is that minimizing, normalizing, rationalizing can be features of the depression itself. So often it's people around you that might notice that something is not quite right long before you do. According to the literature for this tour that I did not read, but had my mom peruse and then paraphrase for me, people who seem happy can actually be the most depressed. Oh no, I seem very happy. I know. But wait, you seem happy too. Oh no, does that mean I'm also depressed? Oh, good thing we're going on this tour. We gotta get the word out. Have they just mutually gaslit themselves? Masking depression though is a thing. Sometimes it's done consciously where somebody is fully aware that they're depressed, but you put on that mask and put on that front in front of friends and family that kind of tries to give this facade of normality, I suppose and good mental health that ultimately is just utterly exhausting. Um, but sometimes it is more unconscious and part of this set of cognitive distortions of minimizing, normalizing, rationalizing your experiences, um, just as we've already talked about. What is depression? Depression. Depression. Who is depression? You or someone you love. 
Where depression. is depression? A grassy field, perhaps. If any of these words describe you or your feelings, you depression. may suffer from depression. depression. Where do we even start? Are you human? If so, you may have depression. Are you a dog? You may have depression. And as we discussed on one of the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend videos, it turns out loads of other animals get prescribed antidepressants as well. I didn't realize that veterinary psychiatry was such a big thing. The prevalence of depression in society is around about four to five percent, i.e. at any one point in time, four to five percent of the population have some sort of depressive disorder. It can start at any time, but the most common age for a first episode of depression is in your mid-twenties, and unsurprisingly, the more socially disadvantaged someone is, the more marginalized, the more stigmatized, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to have depression, with or without other comorbidities like substance use disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, and chronic physical health conditions as well. Bojack? Surprise. <laughs> Is this a bad time? Or? No, it's just heat's broken. Let's go for a walk. So the self-neglect and the lack of motivation for sort of clearing up after yourself and whatever uh, clear signs of depression that are here. And depression is a heterogeneous disorder. There is no right way or wrong way for depression to manifest, though it tends to commonly comprise of three core symptoms of low mood, low energy, and something we call anhedonia. So things that once sparked joy, no longer spark joy. You can then get cognitive symptoms of hopelessness, worthlessness, intense guilt, poor concentration, and more biological symptoms of changes in appetite, changes in libido, changes in sleep. And these are persistent, usually for a matter of weeks, not just a period of hours to days. And this is why I say that depression can become an all-encompassing illness. I think I'm depressed. Yeah? It there we go. When I was having trouble with my book. And then it kind of snowballed into my boyfriend saying I should take antidepressants. There is not always a clear and explainable trigger, but often there is some sort of uh, psychological environmental stressor that may account for why this episode of depression is happening now. Why not it starting a week before? Why not in a few months' time? Why now? Um, but this does not go the full way to explain why this person develops depression when somebody else exposed to those same stressors may not. Are you going to? What's the point? Of no, antidepressants? Depressed. I believe the point is to be antidepressed. Sure. Or you just flip over the nothing and underneath there's more nothing. Then you flip over that nothing. Just back and to that emptiness that we've talked about. Underneath that. So and you that just hopelessness keep that things are ever going to get better. All your life. Because you keep thinking under all that nothing, there's got to be something. But all you find is nothing. So her hesitancy to engage in the treatment that's been recommended and accept the support and the care and the love from other people to try and get better is arguably a symptom of the very depression that needs to be treated. You know, why bother? It's never going to get better, right? So here. I'm registered at Cubs R Us and Baby Hole, but thanks. If I'm going to live in that house again, I want to get rid of the things that remind me of my old life. Look what Uncle Those cues. Jack brought you, Ruthie. It's a 1970s pop art interpretation of the narcissist myth. How appropriate for a baby. Narcissist? I thought the painting was about me. <laughs> but enough about your baby. I also have a favor to ask. <laughs> But narcissism is this inflated sense of self-importance that usually comes with a deep need to be admired, and with that, a very fragile ego if you're not. I thought she said the baby's name was Rufy for a second, like off of Benzo's. That'd be a bad name for a baby. Little baby flu nitrazepam. My house reminds me of the horse I was before. I don't want to be him again, but it's the same house, the same city, just nothing's changed. So how am well, I supposed to? I think he has changed a bit. He's changed by recognizing that. He's being mindful of those cues that can lead to cravings and temptation and a uh, reinstatement of drinking because he's recognizing the negative effects and the consequences that drinking had on his life. Insight is starting to equal change or lead to change. So she's taken the treatment, that's good. One of the potential mechanisms by which SSRIs might directly lead to weight gain is by blocking one of the serotonin receptors, which can be like a secondary action of these drugs. 
It's one of the same reasons that we find that atypical or second generation antipsychotics, alantapine, quetiapine, risperidone, can also lead to weight gain. Well, we know that is a really common and really problematic side effect for many people. And the unique thing about those atypical or second generation antipsychotics compared to the typical or first generation ones is blockade of a particular serotonin receptor called the 5-HT2 receptor. So we think potentially that that holds the link as to why these metabolic side effects may occur with those drugs that block that serotonin receptor. Maybe. Turn to the horse next to you and offer a sign of grace and peace in the name of the Lord. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Compassion focused therapy is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy that focuses on those feelings of shame and guilt to which people can attach those really quite negative and distressing emotions and thought patterns that people seek to try and avoid or numb with things like drugs and alcohol that perpetuate lots of different types of mental illness. Compassion focused therapy has also been found to be really helpful at addressing internalized homophobia in gay people where we know that rates of depression, anxiety, addiction are higher than in the straight population and I have no doubt that it could be applied to other forms of discrimination and stigma too that can again perpetuate those feelings of shame and uh, self-criticism and as usual Bochak is just the best representation of mental health and mental illness on television we got to talk about depression we got to talk about addiction we got to talk about group therapy we got to talk about antidepressants and the different side effects we got to cover a lot there that was lovely let me know what you thought though in the comments below and as usual I will see you for another video very very soon love you bye